Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the fourth installment of Errant Fox Schiff's Family Office University entitled Simplifying Trust Structures for Family Offices, Why, When, and How. Uh, my name is Mike Moyers. I'm a partner in our private clients trust and estates group uh, here in Chicago. Um, as I hope all of you know already, Errant Fox Schiff is a national firm with offices uh, coast to coast in uh, 30 plus lawyers who practice in this field, a good number of whom have joined us today either in the audience or up here on the panel. Um, I'd like to introduce um, my colleagues that are up here with me, my partner Sarah Severson, who needs no introduction, uh, my partner Chris Roman and Luke Harriman as well. Chris and Luke are going to be presenting the slide deck and Sarah and I are going to uh, sort of operate as a panel here pop in with some questions to keep these guys on their toes, maybe sell, tell some anecdotes that are relevant uh, to the topics that we're talking about. Um, as any presenter will tell you, these things are so much more fun for both the presenter and the audience when it's interactive and we have questions and we therefore encourage you, want to ask you to ask questions as we go along here. So if you're here uh, in person, just raise your hand. We have a microphone we'll bring around. You can ask your question. That's important so all the people online can hear uh, what the question is. If you're online, I'm told there's a very uh, intuitive and easy way of submitting your questions. I'm monitoring those over here and we'll either interrupt the guys if you have a question that's pertinent to this or we will also save some time uh, at the end, 10 to 15 minutes to answer questions. We want to make sure all of your questions get answered. Um, and then following the presentation, we'll take as long as we need with questions, then we have a reception over in our nice new space over here with some treats uh, for everybody to get going. So without, uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Chris and Luke, and then they'll get us kicked off. So Chris uh, has a very broad practice. I work with him almost every day. He does a lot of stuff. Um, to accomplish his client's goals, Chris implements a wide variety of estate planning tools, both during life and at death. These tools, including irrevocable trusts and family entities, aim to leverage a client's estate gift and generation skipping transfer tax exemptions to transfer wealth in a tax efficient manner that is also protected from creditors. And then particularly relevant to today, uh, Chris also fixes old estate plans, including modification of irrevocable trust agreements through decantings and settlement agreements we'll be talking quite a bit about. Uh, Luke Harriman. Uh, Luke advises high net worth individuals and families in comprehensive estate planning. Licensed in both Illinois and Florida, he regularly counsels clients on tax and other implications of changing residency. That's all those people that moved back here from Florida, right? Is that the problem? <laughs> he, he also works with both individuals and corporate fiduciaries in estate and trust administration. With that, I will introduce you to Chris. We will kick us off. All right, thank you, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for being here uh, in person and virtually. Um, we're talking about simplifying trust structures today, so we thought we'd start with a quote um, about simplicity. Uh, don't get me wrong, we like our complicated profits interest structures, our sophisticated estate plans, our customized drafting provisions, but today the focus is more uh, practical. And for our ultra high net worth clients and our family offices, some of our best work is in this space where we're simplifying complex legal structures um, and making them understandable for our clients so that they can work within them um, to increase efficiency on a day-to-day -day basis. and then. It also makes it easier to educate the beneficiaries when you have a simple, a simple summary of a plan. Um, so the specific issue that we're going to talk about today is trust and how we simplify them. Uh, and, and just to introduce the topic, haven't we all seen that big file of trust agreements for a wealthy family? Um, you have different trusts, they look different, they feel different, um, and they are different, but do they need to be? So that's what we'll explore today, and then if they don't need to be, uh, what we can do about that. So we're going to go through this in two parts. Um, I'll take part one. Um, we're going to review and summarize the current plan so that we can identify issues. Uh, and then we can take a look at um, identifying challenges and opportunities that we have within a trust structure. Um, then we'll also propose solutions. And we'll do that in the context of our summary so that we can really see how they apply. Um, 
Luke will come in on part two and talk about um, our tools to modify and simplify and consolidate trust. So once we have an idea of where we want to go, how are we going to get there, uh, either under the trust agreement or state law. Uh, so here's the problem. Um, does this sound familiar? You have trusts that have been drafted and created over a period of decades by different firms, by different attorneys, all on different forms. They have different naming conventions, and it's just really confusing when you go in and you look at all the different trusts you have, uh, especially when you have a particular issue and you're trying to identify which trust makes the most sense for a particular problem. Um, we also often see multiple trusts for the same beneficiaries or class of beneficiaries that have different terms, but are really for the same purpose. Um, we also see a line of different successor trustees. So in a trust where the same person is the trustee currently, their backup is different, and there may not be a reason for that. Um, so it's important to look at that because we may not want a different person to step into that role for different trusts. Uh, we see different administrative provisions. So when we're looking at the trust and whether or not we use, want to use them in a particular investment or for a particular reason, we may not know which one says what and which one allows different um, different actions to be taken. Um, and then last here is just our trust for the same beneficiaries uh, that might divide at different times in the future, one at age 35 and maybe one at age 45 with no real, real reason for that. Um, so how do you know if you have a problem here? And how do you know if this is something to really focus on? Um, and we have a test, and it's do you frequently ask, is this the trust that? Is this the trust that um, Uncle Bob is the trustee of or Aunt Jane? Is this the trust where the kids have a power of appointment? Um, is this the trust that's GST exempt? So that, that can all be summarized in a slide, but if you're consistently asking that question or calling your attorneys to answer that question, um, it can be very inefficient uh, when you're trying to attack a specific problem. So why, why is this a problem? Um, I think the first point here is one of our most important, which it's difficult to educate beneficiaries without a concise summary of the structure. So if you're constantly explaining the trust structure before you can dig into a problem, um, you may lose people along the way. Um, so if you have a simple and concise summary of what these trusts say and what the plan says that you can present at each meeting and to answer each question, it makes that conversation much easier because you can quickly get to the, the issue at hand instead of spending your time summarizing the trust. And this second point is a related point is that the benefits of the trust are really maximized when everybody understands the terms, both the trustees and the beneficiaries. Uh, the beneficiaries are going to come to the trustees and ask for a distribution or ask for the trust to do something. They're not going to ask for, they're not going to ask a specific trust to do a specific thing. So then it becomes a part uh, of the trustees role to figure out which of multiple trusts might make sense. The family office is also involved there to figure out what makes sense for a particular beneficiary request. But all of that happens a lot easier if everybody understands exactly what these trusts say. Uh, the last two points here are more practical. Um, inefficiency and cost. Uh, if clients or family offices are consistently reaching out to attorneys to interpret the trusts, um, it takes time and it costs money to do that. And if you have a proper summary and you're able to do that um, internally and then come to us when, with the particular problem at hand or a particular issue, uh, it's much more efficient um, in that way. So, And Chris, can I, can I add to that? Sure. Um, in terms of why is this a problem, I feel like you know, all of us in the all of us in the room are, are busy practitioners, are busy servicing on, and reacting rather than proactively sort of <clears throat> serving a lot of the time. Um, we wouldn't want it that way by design, but many of us are kind of walking the gauntlet and having stuff thrown at us every day. So we're like, okay, we're reacting. We'll answer that question about this one trust. It's really important to find space and time for inflection in our collective um, service of high net worth families because at some point the music stops, right? And everybody sits down in the chair because the grantor has died and all this stuff come home, home, comes home to roost. And we want to avoid, hopefully through some of these planning tips today, having everybody be in a, having a sense of, you know, what happens next, having questions like manage my expectations. What's, how do these all fit together? Who is acting as fiduciary? So one of the things I want to impress today is if you have the luxury of someone that's still, you know, your patriarch and matriarch still living, and all you've been doing is 
not unlike patching a rooftop, right? And there's seven layers of shingles and all you've done is sort of created a new trust for this entity and for that transaction and for that family member. At some point, let's peel all those shingles off and start fresh and say, how does this work, right? Because um, there will become a time where it will be very embarrassing for all of us that serve these families if we can't say with certainty, don't worry, dad just passed, here's, here's the set of instructions we're all following. That's the real gift to the client. So, you know, there are a number of problems associated with um, letting trust structures kind of go rogue. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is say it's not even a, it's not a necessary problem. We know how to fix it. Chris and, uh, Chris and Luke will walk us through that today. But um, time to kind of pull the layers of shingles off and see if we can simplify things. And that's, that's a great segue into our next piece, which is summarizing what, what is currently there. Uh, we really can't move forward with any simplification or any advice or education if we don't know what we have. So we need to summarize and illustrate the entire plan. Um, if there's a particular issue that's sort of nagging at the family that constantly comes up, um, whether that's one of those three items there or something else, that should be identified in the summary and, and reviewed along all of the trust to see if we can... Uh, solve that problem. And as we're solving these problems and developing uh, and modifying the structure, we like to do that in whatever chart or summary we're using so that we can move pieces around, we can add and delete from the chart, show a finish, what a finished product could look at, and make sure that that's what uh, the intention is. So just to dig a little deeper on how, how to do this, it needs to be simple. If it's too long or too complicated and people can't understand it, uh, it's going to be very difficult to use. Um, but if you have simple one page that lists some of these terms, um, it doesn't have to be all of these terms, but these are typically the terms that we use um, in our summaries just to give everybody a feel for what the trust says and how it can be used and how, how it was intended to use moving forward. So we thought we'd do um, a case study here just to look at how this can impact a family office's operations and how it can make day-to-day -day life much easier if we have a consistent set of terms across all of our trusts. So we have a family here, not atypical from, from, from our clients, a uh, heavy real estate investor, but also has private investments and investments in marketable securities. Those investments are made through LLCs that are owned by generational trusts. Um, there are three trusts in particular that cause confusion, um, and the reasons are the trustees are inconsistent, so we have somebody serving as the current trustee, but the successor is different in each case, and the family doesn't necessarily want that because that could cause confusion with three new people coming into this structure. Um, as, a re as a real estate investor, um, guarantees and loans are used often in this family, and the trusts all say different things on whether or not the trust can do those things. So wouldn't it be easier if they all said the same thing? And we knew that every trust could lend or guarantee loans, and then you could use those trusts as you needed them in particular investments. And then any time we're going through this process, is there anything else that we can change along the way? Uh, these trusts have been along, around for a long time, and to have different provisions, and do they need to? What can we do to make things easier in the future? So here's an example of a flow chart. Uh, if you've worked about, with us, you've seen, you've seen t these flow charts before. Um, one box for each trust. Above that dash line in the middle uh, are the trust, the current trust for right now. Um, we have different color coding and dash lines to show certain tax characteristics. We have our grantor trust on the left. Uh, all of these trusts are outside of our client's estate, but he is the beneficiary of the ones um, in green. And then right below the dash line, you'll see that each of these trusts pour into a trust for the client's son and one for the client's daughter. Um, each of those beneficiaries would then have three trusts that all sort of say the same thing. Um, so as we're going through this, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Um, for, at first, we're going to focus on these trusts at the top. So these were our issues that we identified in the case study up front. These are our different successor trustees, and then we have our guarantees and loans that all have guarantee and loan provisions that are all different across the trusts uh, that cause confusion and cause phone calls um, and issues each time uh, this client looks to make a particular real estate investment. Um, 
while we're here, we're looking for other, other modifications that we could make or other, other items that we could pick out. Uh, you'll see in this, uh, set, this focused uh, part of the chart, uh, we have the same trustee issues, but we also have, in many cases, we'll have beneficiaries coming in as sole trustee um, after our client's death at certain ages. Here, those ages are different. Um, there's not really a reason for that other than these trusts were created at different times and different ages were picked. Um, you'll see some other differences across these trusts, including this right of withdrawal. You'll see that typically in older trusts. Um, but there's really nothing here um, that's significantly different that would be a problem to modify so that these trusts could all be the same and perhaps merged uh, in the future. Um, Luke will talk about mergers, but, um, but those, that would be how you could solve, solve this problem. So now we have our chart. We've identified our issues, and we want to propose some solutions. Uh, so this is a table that we would typically use. The, the major focus here was the successor trustees. That made the family very uncomfortable. So in column B here, we're focusing on how we could just solve that issue. What's the easiest way to do that, and how do we do that in the context of the trust agreement? Um, that's laid out here in column B. Um, but we do have these other issues that are really causing um, problems for the office and inefficiencies. So in C, we identify those issues, whether that's the loan, the lending provision, or the guarantee provision, um, or these withdrawal rights in the descendants trust, and trying to identify ways that we can make those modifications to just simplify these trust agreements going forward. Um, and then in our column D is how we do that, which is through decanting in this case. Luke will take you through uh, the particulars there. Uh, but then we've made a recommendation on in our last column here in E. So with your charts and with this table, this is easy to sit down, go through with family, family office, understand what the, current, what the current situation is, what we could change it to, what we could modify trust to change it to, and, and how we would do that. Can I jump in just with sure. one comment on another modification that I've seen some family offices use just in order to keep things straight, and that is to come up with a naming <clears throat> convention for the trust, right? Some people name trusts after the person who created it. Some people name the trust after the beneficiary that it's for. And some people kind of put the tax aspects of the, of the trust into its actual name, right? So a, so a family office may have um, a convention where they want to name the trust after the primary beneficiary and they want to identify its income and GST tax status. So you could go through and say it's the John Smith non-grantor GST exempt trust. And that gives you a lot of information. At least for us tax type people, right, we can sort of look at the name of the trust and understand, you know, what it is and probably understand what its role in the estate plan is from that. And it's sort of having a consistent um, naming convention, however the family office wants to do it, can be another way of simplifying this, especially when it comes to communicating to the family. And, and just to piggyback on that, because that's an excellent point, Mike, um, one of the things to do regardless of whether you use the naming convention is as you're going through this process, track the status, the tax status of the trust so that at the end of the day, if a beneficiary comes and says, I've got six trusts for my benefit, which one do I tap first? Which one do I go to if I want to buy a house? You've got sort of a priority of payment or the data already encapsulated to give a priority of payment to that particular beneficiary. And boy, if I, you know, uh, clients are so grateful to have that, particularly when they're trying to educate the next generation on when, why, and how to access, you know, a whole basket of trust for their benefit. So as you're going through this somewhat, not painstaking, but deliberate process, detailed process, keep a column, maybe, maybe you add E or F that says, you know, tax status of trust or, you know, use this when so that you have that at the, at the ready, when you're ready to create those reports. That's great. And, just to, and then just to finish up this, this case study, we want to do our chart at the end to show what we've done. Uh, here we have our, our consistencies across our current trusts, and we have merged our descendants trust here at the bottom so that those children don't have three trusts for their benefit after the client's death. They just have one, which will make their lives much easier. So this seems simple, but why isn't this done? Um, I'll give Sarah the credit for this first, uh, first bullet, but it's so true. I, it's easier just to go through with momentary inefficiencies on a day-to-day -day basis and not take a step back, reflect, and maybe spend that time up front to really 
solve some of these issues, um, when the, even though those, those, issues, those solutions may pay dividends in the end. Um, it's also difficult to identify the issues or solutions without summarizing them, without having the, the foundational knowledge of what's happening and even and knowing that you can make these, these changes to trust. Um, so it's important to, to spend the time on that summary as well. Uh, this last point on psychological and political barriers is an important one. Um, it depends. It, there are a lot of ways to modify irrevocable trust, and some people and some family members may be uncomfortable with that. Um, are we changing the rules? How will people feel? Um, it's important to address those concerns. Um, a proper knowledge base also helps there because if you truly are changing administrative provisions and everybody understands why and how those are being changed, it shouldn't be that controversial. Uh, but if you are making larger changes, you will need a dialogue and, and communication there. Um, if you don't do this, who suffers? Um, I, I think all of us have mentioned the trust beneficiaries uh, suffer here. Um, it's easier to educate with a simple, consistent approach. Um, that way you're not spending time explaining the trust uh, before getting to a, a particular problem. And this foundation of knowledge uh, really helps going forward. And when the time comes, when the trust, when they are the beneficiary or they are looking um, to a priority of payments they have, they have somewhere they can look. Um, for the trustees of multiple trusts, it's also important uh, that they have a clear knowledge of what these trusts say and that they're easy to decipher. Um, so when they're responding to beneficiary requests, um, they know exactly what the trusts say that they're working, working on. Um, and it's very similar for family office employees who are also looking at these trusts to advise, advise the family members. Um, so that, that's setting up, Luke, to talk about how, how do you actually do all of these things. Um, once you have your summary and your solutions, how do you implement them? And uh, I'll turn it over. Thanks, Chris. So I think you might have the impression that, you know, if you haven't worked in this area a lot, at first it might seem like, okay, doesn't everybody know, you know, all the trust professionals and the financial advisors, doesn't everybody just know what's the GST status of a trust? You know, is it a grantor trust? Is it a non-grantor trust? <laughs> and surprisingly, you know, a lot of, there isn't as good of a kind of day-to-day -day awareness of that as you might hope. Um, a lot of times if we have a new client coming in, what they just give us is just, it's just a box, <laughs> right? Like here is a box with all the trusts or the virtual equivalent, which is, you know, here is the share file link and here are 97 PDFs with different things. And it really is valuable just to figure out, you know, like what the heck is going on with everything. Um, and that's kind of how I see the first part of the presentation is keeping track of, keeping track of all that stuff. But now we'll talk about, okay, so what do we, what do we actually do? What are the, the mechanisms that we can use to consolidate trust, to simplify trusts, to kind of, you know, as Chris used in that example, we had a, one set of beneficiaries where when mom and dad died, there were going to be like six different or three or six different trusts for each beneficiary. Can we shrink that down? Can we even take trusts that are you know currently irrevocable trusts, combine them? If we can do that in a way that doesn't cause any adverse tax consequences or doesn't create too much potential fiduciary liability for whoever's doing it, that can be that can be really valuable. So how do you start thinking about this? A few things to look at and try to understand for each of the trusts that you're working with. Who are the beneficiaries? Seems obvious, but there's, there's some nuance to that. What are the distribution standards in the trusts? What is the, the generation skipping transfer tax status or, or GST status? What's the perpetuities period for the trust? Is it a grantor trust? And what is the state income tax filing status? This is not an exhaustive list, and it's not really kind of a by rote, you know, if all these things match up, then you can do it. Um, but in a general sense, when you start looking at different factors here, when you start seeing a couple different trusts that have the same beneficiaries, same GST status, they're both grantor trusts or they're both non-grantor trusts, that's a good time to start thinking about, huh, you know, maybe there's a way, to, maybe there's an opportunity to kind of consolidate these trusts.
so beneficiaries, you know, to state the obvious, if you have two trusts for completely different beneficiaries, you're not going to combine them. Um, there are there is a little bit of nuance here in that you will often have trusts where you know some trust could be for the benefit of say only one individual, and another trust is for the benefit of both the individual and their children. And this distinction is often lost on you know the people who are the beneficiaries of the trust or the trustees. So identify for each trust you know exactly who is, who is the current beneficiary, meaning who can get distributions from that trust. Generally speaking, you don't want to add beneficiaries when you're combining trusts and consolidating trusts. Um, that can create some risk for the whoever the trustee is that's doing that. It is possible to remove beneficiaries sometimes, but you do want to be careful of that because you're removing somebody and you want to you know think through that whole process um, before you do that. You know we're going to go through toward the end a number of techniques which are actually extremely powerful in terms of how you can change trusts that are irrevocable, right? So a long time ago, it was basically, you had this trust agreement, it's an irrevocable trust, it can't be changed. There's a lot more flexibility now. We can do, we can do quite a bit. And sometimes it's tempting just to jump in and say, we can do this and this and this and this, we have the power to do that. Um, but to, to quote uh, Jeff Goldblum's character from the, the movie Jurassic Park, they were, so, they were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Um, so just a, a word of, of caution there. You can do a lot with modifying these trusts, but you can do a lot of things that could completely blow the tax status of the trust or get you sued or you know something else bad happened. So, yeah. <laughs> so you think about it, but we do have some amazingly powerful tools for this. Let me jump in on that and let me just say something that I tell clients all the time. You know, we, we often get irrevocable trusts. And, and I, as I explained to clients, that's really a term of art, a tax term of art. It means the person who created the trust can't change it. But we got a lot of different ways uh, of modifying it beyond that. But that doesn't answer the question whether you should. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but you're right. And, and I would also... Um, Maybe I should save this for the decanting part, which I know you're going to get to shortly, but there's an ACTEC piece on decanting um, that I would just encourage everyone to read. It's like 2014 or so. It came out a while ago, but it's sort of a white paper on the history of all these things and really comes to the conclusion that trustees have kind of always had the common law power to decant a trust just by making a distribution to another trust for the benefit of the same people. Um, and and I just think we haven't focused on that. All these decanting statutes came out and it sort of became a thing, but it's really something that trustees have always been able to do. Yeah, yeah. and we'll get, we'll get into that. Distribution standards. So each trust has a different distribution standard. This is just what governs when money can come out to the beneficiary and on and on what terms. This is one area where we can do some combination. You know, trusts don't necessarily have to have exactly the same distribution standards in order to be consolidated with some limitations. Generally speaking, when we're working with the different techniques that we're going to talk about, for example, decanting, if you have a broader distribution standard, um, so in this, this being a trust where a trustee has more latitude to distribute trust assets to a beneficiary than less, you're going to have a little bit easier time working with that, right? So broader distribution standards, what we would call non-ascertainable standards, things like best interests, comfort, welfare, that sort of thing. Narrower standards, you know, health, education, maintenance, and support, those are a little bit more limited, although there are still some things that, that we can do there. Um, notice that this is not necessarily fixed all the time. So a lot of trusts will grant a trustee the power to make distributions only for health, education, maintenance, and support if that trustee is also a beneficiary. This is for estate tax reasons. But if there's another person acting as trustee, they can make distributions for you know best interest, comfort, welfare, any of those purposes, and it makes it a lot easier. So some of the solutions we propose often end up with, you know, you need to find somebody else to act as the trustee to do this. Um, this can work well. You also have to consider you know, who wants to do that. Uh, you know, who's going to be the person who is put in that role to exercise their discretion and make 
a distribution from the trust, but it can be very useful. A couple things that you can't change in terms of distributions from the trust. If there is what's called a vested interest, or um, which is, has a couple of different subcategories, mandatory income distributions, for example, if you have a, a marital trust, right, one spouse dies, there's a quote-unquote marital trust that's created for the surviving spouse. You can't get rid of the mandatory income distributions. Um, if someone has a right to withdraw trust assets, say you have a trust, and a lot of older trusts are structured like this, where they get, you know, a third at 25, a third at 30, and a third at 35, the beneficiary can take that money out, with the idea being, you know, hopefully, you know, they'll take it out to 25 and blow a third of it, but they'll still have, you know, hopefully one third left or two thirds left. Um, if the beneficiary has passed that age, you really can't do anything with that withdrawal, right? Right. That's that's pretty much set. If they haven't, though, there is some opportunity to do some planning there, especially for either older trusts or trusts that were not anticipated to get as large as they have gotten. If you have a trust where a beneficiary can take all the money out at age 50 and they're age 46, you might be able to do some modifications to that trust that let you enhance creditor protection, potentially enhance some of the estate and gift tax benefits when you do that. So these are all things that we're kind of looking at when the client drops off the box. You know, what I'm looking through is I'm flipping through, seeing what are the distribution standards, what are the withdrawal rights, can we do anything here? Uh, everyone's favorite is the generation skipping transfer tax, uh, which is abbreviated GSTT or GST. This is a tax, an extra tax that applies when there is distributions from a grandchild level to a, a grandparent level to a grandchild level. Important thing to note for most people, you have a certain amount of GST exemption that you can allocate to a trust, which makes it basically not subject to this tax and usually also not subject to estate tax either. Different kinds of trusts, there are trusts that are non-exempt. So uh, they have an inclusion ratio of one. Trusts that are exempt have an inclusion ratio of zero. And some trusts which were created before 1986 and irrevocable and meeting certain requirements that are quote unquote grandfathered from GST. Uh, there's a fourth category. As I know there is a fourth category, trust created by this, this one doesn't come up as much. I know you wanted me to it put doesn't, it. It doesn't, but it comes up more and more. <laughs> okay, can, right? you want to, you want to go we, on? We never <laughs> set out to be international tax planners, but we've become <laughs> international tax planners over the last 15 years or so because you just you can't work in the high net worth space without getting involved in international uh, aspects. And one of the great things our clients who have non-resident alien relatives is that those folks are just not subject <laughs> to our transfer tax system, so they can put any non-U.S. asset in a trust, and it's simply not subject to our rules. And that's a very powerful planning technique if you're in the right situation. Yeah. Yes. My, my, Mike is right about that. The main point, of it, though, is that don't mix these. You know, this is more of a hard rule. You don't want to mix a non-exempt trust with an exempt trust or vice versa. For complicated reasons, this ends up being way less than ideal. Definitely be careful if you're doing anything to mess with a grandfather trust or a trust created by a foreign person that's not subject to GST. Again, you might have the power under state law to do this. It could still be a terrible idea, going back to the Jeff Goldblum quote. Different trusts have different, what we would call, perpetuities periods. So the rule against perpetuities, everybody's second favorite subject after the generation skipping transfer tax. Basically, it's a rule that says a lot of trusts can't last forever, right? So if you've ever seen... Um, the movie The Descendants with George Clooney, that was based in part on a trust that was created a long time ago and was running out, and because of this, there was all this family drama, and they had to, they had to make some changes to it. Especially if you have trusts that were either, one, created at different times, right? So before about the year 2000, Illinois had the rule against perpetuities, and any trusts that you're going to see before that date are going to have a hard date on which they have to stop. Right, newer trusts generally in Illinois can go forever if the if the right language is in the trust document. Um, Do you have a question. Yeah. But let's get the. Uh, and the mic to. Yeah, one other reason they might be different. They might have a different set of measuring lines. 
One other reason they may, may have a different perpetuities period is they may um, have a different set of measuring lives. Yeah, exactly, right. So these are, if you go back to a lot of old trust documents, they will say this trust must terminate not later than 21 years after the death of the last survivor of the descendants of grandpa who were living on January 1st, 1962, or the descendants of, you know, Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, yeah. <laughs> um, and and they would try to kind of shoehorn in as many of those people as they could to create a longer you know period for the trust. Um, that could make a difference, or if trusts are created in different states. So, for example, Illinois has perpetual trusts; they can go forever. Florida trusts are limited to let's see, until about a year ago, they were limited to three hundred and sixty years. Now they can go a thousand years. Uh, so you could have different trusts. You know, you have your one Illinois trust that can go forever. Your Florida trust can go for a thousand years. You might think those are exactly the same. Uh, they're not. They're, they're not quite the same. Even though, you know, who knows? You know, a thousand years, like it, you know, is, is the state of Florida will probably be underwater by then anyway. But it's, it, it is still relevant. So keep that in mind. Main rule here is you don't want to lengthen a perpetuities period. Um, this leads to. Bad, yes. <laughs> Adverse tax consequences without going into uh, uh, further detail. Keep in mind, is the trust a grantor trust or not? So what is a grantor trust? It's a trust where the grantor, the person who created the trust, pays the trust's income taxes. Um, due to what I call an estate planning miracle, this is not considered a taxable gift for the estate and gift tax. That can be really useful. Keep track of when trusts are grantor trusts or non-grantor trusts. State income taxes, um, often overlooked, but actually a pretty interesting topic. There's often an assumption that trusts have one state where they have to file state income taxes and only one, and you know it's just one and not zero or more. There's actually a patchwork of different state statutes that govern when a trust has to make filings of state income taxes. So for example, in Illinois, that's generally with some complicated caveats. Where the grantor lived, did they live in Illinois when the trust was created? In other states like California, it's where the trustee lives. So there are trusts that are subject to a state to state income tax in multiple states in one state, and there are some trusts that are not subject to state income tax in any state. So there's a the challenge here is that you don't want to inadvertently when consolidating trusts, excuse me, getting a little, I'm getting a little carried away here. Um, you don't want to accidentally, for example, consolidate a trust that is not subject to California income tax with a trust where the trustee is in California. You've just subjected that whole trust to California income tax when you do that. But there are some in opportunities here where you might be able to reduce that state income tax burden. This is just another way of kind of keeping track of this. So. This is an example summary sheet that you might create either internally or to use with um, or to use with clients or for your own trust or keeping track of things. In our, you know, in, in, in my system, the blue underlines are links, right? So you can just click on that and the trust comes up. And this is, really gives you a way to identify at a quick glance kind of what are these basic characteristics, right? So this, who's the grantor? Who's the beneficiary? Who's the trustee? It was Billy. Now it's Bobby. We have this documentation that says it. The trust is GST exempt. It has an inclusion ratio of zero. It's a grantor trust. Roughly what assets are there? Something like this and keeping this updated can be really, really powerful, um, especially for clients who have a lot of different trusts going on. All right, so we'll talk some about the actual techniques that we use for this. Decanting, non-judicial settlement agreements, trust protectors, and the exercise of powers of appointment. Um, decanting, what is decanting anyway? There's a complicated analogy with wine, and there's the decanter. I don't really know wine, so I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. Basically, decanting is if a trustee, and Mike talked about this before, if they have the power to make a distribution to a beneficiary, Stands to reason they should also have the power to make a distribution to another trust for the beneficiary. So we've always had this power under common law. Now it's become much more common since it is authorized by state statutes in, in most every state. Um, 
There are a few different ways to do this, and it's actually quite a, a flexible tool. So the classic way is you take the assets of one trust, and there are rules about this in terms of how similar the trusts have to be. It varies based on the breadth of the discretion that the trustee has when they're doing this, but you know you could just distribute the assets of that one existing trust to another existing trust. Um, you can create an entirely new trust in a decanting, right, and have you have your new trust document. Or, um, all right, these are not actually trademark, but <laughs> these are my uh, my favorite methods called decant restating and decant mending. Uh, to explain this, some state statutes, state decanting statutes, including Illinois, specifically say that the decanting power can be used either to, as you know, is traditionally done put assets from one trust to another trust, or just to modify the trust agreement. Um, so this can be done either by amending part of it or by restating it with a new trust document. Again, as long as you're following the requirements of the decanting statute and staying within the trustee's grant of authority to do that. Um, so very powerful, te very powerful technique. We use it, we use it quite often. Somebody get that man a microphone. <laughs> Mike, Mike made the good point that um, there's a good argument that common law just allows trustees to decant. It's important to remember, though, that the IRS doesn't necessarily agree with that. Uh, they are looking for either case law that approved it uh, or a statute. So you always have to work through can you get away with a common law decanting? Do you have enough support so that if the IRS came to question it, you'd, you'd be able to back it up? Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Um, and there are some other issues in, involved with decanting, including potential, obviously, fiduciary liability issues. If you do something into decanting that a beneficiary doesn't like, um, the beneficiary could have some issue with the trustee for that. Or, you know, some concern that, in certain types of decanting, if the beneficiary is deemed to have consented or agreed to that, you know, are they making some kind of a gift for gift tax purposes? Um, Chris will talk a little bit more about that general issue when he gets to the CCA 2035-25018 at the end, which we'll talk about a little bit. Non-judicial settlement agreements. Um, we've had these for a while. These are just an agreement between all of the fiduciaries of a trust, so if it's just a trustee, just the trustee and all the beneficiaries, that they are going to change something uh, about the trust. What can they change is an interesting question and doesn't get, you know, there aren't a lot of appellate cases that are litigating what exactly is within the scope of what you can do in a non-judicial settlement agreement, but the statutes, you know, and here we have some from Illinois, are actually pretty broad, um, especially the last one, modification of the terms of the trust pertaining to the administration of the trust. So that's open to some interpretation about what you can do in a non-judicial settlement agreement. Obviously, you want to consider, again, whether you should do this, even if you can, but that it, they can be really useful, especially for changing... Um, trustees, right? So there's a specific provision that says you can, a, a non-judicial settlement agreement can address removal appointment or removal of appointment of a trustee, trust protector, etc. This is especially useful if you have an old trust that names as successor trustee like the brother-in-law who's now in jail or, you know, the accountant from 30 years ago. And if there isn't a method to change that in the trust agreement as it is, non-judicial settlement agreements can be really helpful. We'll go over these last two a little bit more quickly. Trust protectors are individuals that can have a limited power to make amendments to a trust. So this can be useful if um, trusts are ultimately going to be consolidated, getting them, getting them to the point where that can happen. Another consideration, of course, is who wants to do that job, right? Because it, uh, you know, there's some potential liability there in some cases, but they can be really useful. And kind of going to more basics, which you know we've had forever, exercises of powers of appointment. So 
powers of appointment. It just is something that gives a person, usually a beneficiary, the power to direct where the assets of a trust goes. Different rules on powers of appointment, when you can exercise them, what you can do, but they are really useful you know, for our purposes for consolidating trusts. So here's one of my favorite charts. This is for a client named Jane um, who has a lot of different trusts, right? So there are different trusts over different generations. On the left, she has her revocable trust or living trust, which you know, when she dies, it's going to go to a family trust and a marital trust for her husband, John. And then she has one, two, three, four, five other trusts that were created, some under her father's revocable trust. There's an insurance trust. There's another intentionally defective grantor trust. We can consolidate a lot of these, some during lifetime, right? So some of these can be consolidated just by decanting or merging trusts, which is kind of at the top there, or after death. And so in this estate plan, because Jane has powers of appointment over these trusts, she can exercise them in favor of separate trusts for her kids. So the before in this picture on the next slide would show each child having like seven different trusts and it would be a huge mess. But here, can all kind of come down to a couple different trusts for the kids who are called, you know, in this example, Susie and Billy. In this example, and you can't necessarily do this quite this cleanly all the time, but you can end up with just one exempt trust, one GST exempt trust, and one non-exempt trust for each of Billy and Susie. So you have four trusts total instead of like 24. So very useful uh, technique there. Also just the work of visualizing this for, for clients or for yourself or your trust is really, really helpful for people. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris for some uh, fun technical details about the gift tax implications of trust modification. All right, Luke, uh, Luke teased this, but uh, I'll introduce this. I think there are a few, few people who have some comments here. But um, the IRS gave us this sort of present around the holidays at the end of the year last year. Uh, I thought I'd start with just what is a CCA, just as a, a reminder on what we're talking about here. Um, this is the, national, the IRS National Office providing advice to one of its field counsel, um, likely to support a strong litigation uh, position. So it's not precedential, but it does give you a view uh, into what the IRS is thinking on a particular issue. Um, before I get into the facts of, of this CCA, just some background. Luke mentioned grantor trusts. They're really a pass-through for income tax purposes, so the person who set up the trust will pay the income tax for the, for the assets in the trust. Um, it's a great estate planning technique. The assets in the trust are growing tax-free. Um, the grantor's estate is being reduced by the payment of taxes. Um, but until you get to a point where the grantor does not want to pay the taxes anymore and you hear um, the kids have enough and they should pay their own taxes, uh, at that point, in most cases, you can turn off these grantor trust powers um, and you can create a trust that's paying its own taxes at that point. Um, but wouldn't the best of both worlds be if there was a if there was an option to do that. So each year um, at tax time, the trustee could decide whether or not to either reimburse the grantor for taxes paid or just let the grantor pay the taxes. Um, so there is a revenue ruling on point uh, that says that if that reimbursement right's discretionary and that power in the trustee's discretionary, then this is okay. Um, so, we, so you can move along like that. You can put that in your trust agreement and this right to reimbursement is fine. Um, but what if your trust doesn't have that? Can you add it? Um, and we do have a PLR on that point that says that type of modification is administrative and that it's okay and there's no gift there from anybody. Um, but then we have this CCA which looks at exactly that issue um, and it's what are the gift tax consequences um, to one of these modifications. So here it was a court modification. Um, the beneficiaries received uh, had to consent to this modification to add a tax reimbursement clause to a grantor trust. Um, and the CCA analyzed this issue and came back with our conclusion here, which is that the beneficiaries uh, have made a gift uh, by giving up their beneficial interest in this trust. Um, so that's a change, of course, for the IRS. I mentioned this revenue ruling. They distinguished that ruling uh, because that provision was in the trust document from the start. And they also had a footnote about this PLR that said that it does not no longer reflects 
uh, the position of the office. So we have, we have this out there. Um, there is a big open issue, which is what is the value of that gift? Um, if you think about it, it's you're giving uh, the grantor could be reimbursed for income taxes in the future. It, it would be difficult to quantify that. Um, commentators have suggested that number is anywhere from zero to um, the entire value of the trust because it can't be valued. So that is a big open issue. And then we're also looking at the extensions of this type of ruling into other areas, uh, particularly in, in modifications where beneficial interests are changed. Um, in a decanting, for example, that removes a beneficiary um, is that beneficiary's consent a gift. Um, so uh, there are a number of extension here, extensions of this. Um, this has sort of been a hot topic the first, the first few months of this year. And, uh, and, uh, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of different sort of um, thoughts and, and ideas on this and how to just avoid, there are ways to avoid it. Um, there are some, some thoughts on whether or not uh, it's something we should really be worried about. Um, but, you know, some of, some of the things that we've been thinking about doing are just adding a decanting power to the trust. As Mike mentioned, um, there is that common law decanting power. You can also add it to your trust agreement. Um, you can also put these provisions in your trust from the beginning, like in that revenue ruling. Um, there are some issues um, with whether or not creditors can reach those assets at that point, so you need to check your state law. Um, and a few, other, a few others quickly, uh, you, can, you can turn off the grantor trust power if you want. Um, you can also make loans from the trust. So there are some options here, but it is a very important ruling to keep an eye on and, uh, and what happens in the future here. So, so th this, uh, this memorandum, I guess, um, has gotten a lot of attention. I'm sure there's a lot of you that have seen it written up, and e even there's a, a series uh, going around. Is this the most important ruling in a decade that, that I've, <laughs> I've seen? Um, and we were right in the middle of decanting like a nine-figure trust when this thing came out. So we did a whoa, wait, hold on, let's uh, carefully reevaluate this. And you know, I think the reaction of the estate planning bar to this ruling was very negative to start with. My mind certainly was. I, I thought this was settled in the 2016 ruling where they said that you could could modify the trust without a, a gift happening. But when I did a, a deep dive and went back um, and reviewed the various private letter rulings on what modifications to trusts can result in a gift, a deemed a gift, by the beneficiaries, you know, there's a lot of rulings out there like adding adopted people to the class of beneficiaries, for example. There's even a ruling that says moving from a state where adopted people are not by default deemed to be beneficiaries to making to a new state when that that does include uh, adopted persons that changing the governing law of the trust by itself is a gift and the in the, the the linchpin on all those is that you've added new people to the trust who can get distributions so i in in when you're adding a discretionary uh, tax reimbursement power to the grantor that's kind of what you're doing, I hate to admit. And I came away agreeing with this ruling at the end of the day, and I think it's really the 2016 ruling that is uh, kind of out of line uh, with the long history uh, of these things. But so so I think this ruling is probably correct, and, and what you need, or this memorandum, is probably <clears throat> legally correct. And what you just need to be very careful about is adding beneficiaries to the trust. That's the, the, the key element here that got folks in trouble, the other element is that they did it in a transaction where the beneficiaries had to consent as well, okay? So if you, you don't have either one of those factors, I think the existing authorities, you're probably pretty good. And what we ended up doing with our trust is um, we have a common law decanting power and we concluded that we could go ahead and exercise that without any beneficiary consent or involvement whatsoever, and we think that's going to distinguish us uh, uh, in our decanting enough from, from this ruling. Um, but this, this ruling, I don't think it's at the end of this discussion. Maybe with the grantor trust uh, reimbursement issue, this is the last word, but this really raises the issue, what other things can beneficiaries do is the exercise of a power of appointment currently during the lifetime by a beneficiary. Is that a gift? It, you know, it, it raises some from metaphysical tax issues, which some court is going to have to resolve at some point. But as far as the grantor trust uh, reimbursement provision is concerned, um, I, I kind of came away convinced that 
but this is probably the right ruling. I don't say that very often. <laughs> Not the IRS. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've heard you say that. Right. <laughs> you have a question? Could, could you talk about, the, from a practical perspective, how does the IRS find out about these decantings? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you would find out, um, you could find out on an estate tax return when trusts are provided. Uh, that would be one time. Um, and or you could, they could find out about it on a gift tax return also when you're reporting a gift to the new trust. Uh, they could see that trust. There could be an audit and maybe some other, other trusts uncovered or sort of the past history of that trust uncovered. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I know people do decantings differently. Sometimes you know, folks treat it like a continuation of the same trust and use the same EIN. But a lot of times people treat it as a distribution and get a new EIN for the trust to which the assets are, are transferred. So if you get the new EIN, that's... That's kind of a red flag. That would be easy for them to spot, I think. All right. Other questions on this uh, CCA before we move on? I think. Well, this is our last slide here. When I leave, what do I do next? Uh, I, I think the easy answer is just to take a look at, at your set of trusts, and if you have difficulty administering them, knowing what they say, you have options. So... Uh, Think about whether or not a summary makes sense and, and think about some of the steps that you can take to, to make them simpler. So. I think the technical answer was walk down the hall and have a drink. But yes, that's um, right. after that, I, I guess just by a show of hands, I mean, how many of you have structures that you've, either you or your clients or the families you've served, have gone untended, undiagnosed for many, many years and sort of how difficult is it to find time, space in your life um, to sit down and do that diagnostic? Because I, I know it sounds like a big ask, but it's well worth marking, you know, two Fridays off your calendar and saying then devote all day Friday, the next two Fridays, to taking a look at this. So since that was a more than compounded question, I'll rephrase it. <laughs> How many of you have trust structures that you've not looked at in many, many years? Yeah. And if you're willing to speak freely, what's preventing you from, if anything, from looking at those or re-examining, um, you know, what they say and how they operate? There's always something more pressing to be done, probably. I'm afraid Good. that's the case. Um, I would say cost as well. Cost. A lot of the time, I mean, I might yeah. find something for one client, and then the client might not want me to look through all the trust documents to see if there's an issue. Right. Great point. Great point. Um, one of the hardest things, I think, in serving clients that are mortal is that they'll never see what a pain in the behind it is when they're gone. So something to keep in mind is just, you know, when you're thinking about the next generation, which is often near and dear to their hearts, at least we hope they are, um, you know, that can be a good reason, you know, educating the next gen. Let's talk, you know, hey, dad, what do these trusts say? Do they still do what you think they do? And how do you want me to explain them to your kids? That can sometimes be the hook you need to embark on that kind of project. So and we're happy to be a resource if, um, you know, if starting the project is, is the hurdle you have to overcome. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, there's a drink waiting for you Thanks, then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.